Welcome to Ohio Mysteries. I'm Steve. And I'm Paula. And we have been doing a podcast for nearly four years, sharing all kinds of diverse mysteries about the Buckeye State. Now we are slowly but surely working to move our episodes to YouTube. So every other week, we'll give the full visual treatment to an episode. Images, videos, documents, whatever we can find. We did that last week. We'll give you another one next week. And in between, you'll find what we're doing today, a short episode with a few images. So today, we're going to talk about reincarnation, about how one woman who lived in Macon, Georgia, became convinced she had lived an entire life in Marietta, Ohio. There, she was involved in a tragic Romeo and Juliet kind of affair. I also remember she stunned some of the locals with the knowledge of Marietta and the way she found some evidence of her past with no help. Steve definitely qualifies for things that make you go, hmm. Well, without further delay, Ohio Mystery presents the reincarnation of Sandra Jean Jenkins. And look, if you enjoy these stories, please hit the like button and be sure to subscribe to this channel so you don't miss any future episodes. It's time for a new mystery. I'm your co-host, Steve Yoder, and with me is our storyteller and researcher, Paula Schleiss, an award-winning journalist who spent some 30 years telling these kinds of stories at the Akron Beacon Journal. Hi, everybody. So here's a topic we haven't tackled before, Paula, reincarnation. Yes. And I got to say, whether you believe in reincarnation or not, it's a really fascinating topic, and I think a lot of people are intrigued by the concept. I know I am. Me too, and I guess that's kind of the topic that will always be a mystery because who can prove it? Well, or can you? Well, that sounds like a challenge. Okay, so for this story, we're actually starting out in Macon, Georgia. And there's a girl of about five years old, and she's having a strange dream. In it, she sees a young girl standing on the side of a cobbled road, waiting with her parents. A carriage pulls up. She can smell the horses. She can hear the sound of their hooves. She can smell the leather. She can feel the cold night air on her skin. She sees the girl. It doesn't look like her physically. And yet, she knows this girl. She feels this girl. Now, in her waking hours, the young dreamer, her name is Georgia, like the state where she lives, She'll try to sketch the girl again and again, tearing up pictures that don't look right, trying hard with her crayons and colored pencils to get the right hair, the right eyes, the right nose, the right chin. And she always draws a house, a house that she sees in her dreams. The house goes with this girl somehow. She's just not sure how. Now, in her sleeping hours, Georgia will visit her vision again. Only the girl in her dreams isn't always a girl. Sometimes she's grown into a young woman. And sometimes Georgia isn't sleeping at all. Sometimes the images come to her not as dreams, but as memories. It's not like a childhood memory, she once said. It feels different. It's like taking a picture from my mind, projecting it on a screen, and just replaying it over and over. Now prominent in Georgia's dreams and memories is a river and a young man in a brown suit with a derby hat. Sometimes the young man is alone, sometimes he is with the girl, but it's definitely an era that she has never known, a time when there were no planes or automobiles. She sees ships with huge wheels on either side, paddle wheel boats that she's never seen in her life. Now, as an adult, Georgia Rudolph tries to understand these moments. Some of them are lingering and detailed. Some come and go quick as a flash. But they all have the feel of the early 1900s. Well, in 1984, Georgia Rudolph turned to Dr. Douglas Smith, and he agrees to try regressive hypnosis on her. Dr. Smith thinks Georgia might be affected by some childhood trauma, Maybe some experience her brain was trying to sort out. 
Or maybe these visions were an aspect of a multiple personality disorder. Maybe her brain was trying to help her become someone else. The very last thing on his mind is reincarnation. Now, Steve, do you want, just for the benefit of our audience, do you want to explain what reincarnation is? Yeah, reincarnation is uh, when you pass away, you come back as somebody else. And some yeah. people have, you know, different aspects of that. Like uh, if you were somebody who was a Nazi, maybe you'd come back as a Jewish person. Well, there, yeah, there's definitely a spiritual idea yeah. that karma, you know, maybe your your soul needs to learn the other side. And right. That's true. That's yeah. true. Well, whether it's that specific or not, there there are a lot of people that believe that when your spirit is reborn, Uh, it can retain vestiges of its former life. And those are memories that might reveal themselves in lucid waking moments, like little visions, or in the form of dreams. And Georgia seems to be having both of these. And she starts to think, well, maybe reincarnation is the answer to what is happening to her. So during the first session of hypnosis, Dr. Smith refers to Georgia by her name. I don't know who you're talking to, Georgia said. Well, if this isn't Georgia, then who is it? The doctor asks her. And suddenly, we have a name attached to that little girl and that young woman of Georgia's visions. My name is Sandra Jean Jenkins, she tells Dr. Smith. Well, over the course of several sessions, Sandra shares more about herself. She was born in 1895. She had brown hair and brown eyes. Through hypnosis, Georgia can now see herself as Sandra Jean Jenkins standing on a paddle wheel steamer. The young man, who is sometimes her companion, is there, and he has a name now, too, Tommy Hicks. They are sweethearts, and they have scheduled a date with the minister. But they're not going to make it down the aisle. Days before they were to be married, Tommy was on a ship and swept overboard in a storm. His body was never found. Sandra Jean was devastated and finally pushed over the edge when she discovered she was pregnant. Oh, wow. Sandra killed herself by drowning herself in a lake, and she was buried on a hill in an unmarked grave. Georgia said she was standing near Sandra Jean's grave, and she could see an angel statue with one arm raised up. Now, Georgia, she was shocked to learn some of these details through hypnosis. These weren't things that she had been aware of in her dreams or her daytime visions. And Dr. Smith, he's astonished. His patient seems very stable, very down-to-earth. And while the things she's saying under hypnosis seem far-fetched, He's really impressed by the emotion, the effect, the detail that comes through. Well, I'm sure he's seen both spectrums of somebody who comes in and might be, you know, I don't know, maybe not a believer in hypnosis and somebody who's just yeah, genuine, I'm, you know, genuine person. Right. I think if you do enough of these, you probably get to be a good judge of character. Yeah, definitely. And I, I would like to think that I could read that in a person. I don't know. But if it's your career and you're doing that all the time... I would hope that you could tell the difference. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Anyway, he says, and here's a quote from him, she is very sincere in her belief that she actually subjectively experienced all of the things that she has experienced in that past life that she described. She's not faking or pretending. Now, the sessions with Dr. Smith, they revealed something else. Georgia repeatedly mentioned the name Marietta. She came to learn that there was a town called Marietta in Ohio, and suddenly she felt drawn there. The pieces of the puzzle were falling into place. So in 1985, Georgia travels to Ohio. She's arranged for a local reporter in Marietta by the name of Ted Bauer to accompany her around town. I'll show you some of the places that you talked about over the phone, he tells her. I know, she says. I'll show you where to go. Oh, man. Yeah. Well, Georgia's knowledge of the town is surprising. At one point, she stops in front of an insurance company, and she begins describing the interior of an ice cream parlor. And the reporter's amazed. She's never been there. She's never? She had never been there. And that, I mean, it's an insurance company now. The ice cream parlor had closed in 1937. It hadn't even been there for decades. 
And it was like 11 years before Georgia was even born. And this is before the internet. Yes. Where you would, you know, maybe see some old 1985, exactly. It would be really hard wow. to get that kind of detail. Ted Bauer, the reporter, he even goes and finds the son of the man who operated the ice cream parlor, and he checks with him about the details that Georgia shared. And this guy said it matched almost exactly what the interior of that man. parlor had looked like. So Georgia, she said, you know, she's, she's a little frightened at what's coming out of her, but at the same time, she says, there was an excitement that started to build in me. It was like, this is really real. I really was this girl. So many of Georgia's recollections were taken to a local historian in Marietta, and the historian verified them. But there was still a major problem with the story. Georgia and no one can find a record of a Sandra Jean Jenkins in Marietta. Hmm. So Georgia, she goes next to this neighboring town, Newport, Ohio. It was a farming community. There's no record of Sandra there either, but as soon as she gets to town, there's this old familiarity that washes over her again. She knows this town. The first thing I saw when entering Newport was a big gray house, Georgia said. It sent chills through my body. This is my house. This is where I lived. I could see a room, and I knew that this had been her bedroom. This was the house that Sandra had lived in. Now, there's another recurring theme in her dreams that Newport, Ohio, brings to life. In her visions, she had often been standing on the steps of a church. She leaves the steps of the church. She walks two blocks to a cemetery. There she finds a winding path to the right, it curves, and then it straightens out, and she stops at a grave. In her dreams, she knows that this is the grave of her grandmother, of Sandra Jean Jenkins' grandmother, but she could never read the name on the marker. In the dreams. In the dreams. Well, in Newport, she sees a church, catches her breath. She walks over to its steps, and then she repeats what happens in her vision. She uses the steps as the starting point. She walks two blocks. She finds a path to a cemetery. So she's doing everything that she, she... Okay. Exactly. And the path is winding to the right and then straightening out. And just in her dream, it ends at a headstone. Before we go, that's that would be creepy to me, even though I'm doing it. it, it oh, yeah. It, it just... You know, I'm 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 doing something that's I only dreamed of, and in a part of your mind, you think that's got to be fake, but then you start seeing it, and, and it's like, actually happening. I know, I've got like goosebumps right now <laughs> thinking of what that would feel like. That's fantastic. And then to come up on this headstone, it's like I can now read the name. Now I know what my grandmother's name is. Yes, and it was Mary Bevan Green. Okay. Now, this is the missing link to Georgia's story, or rather, Sandra Jean Jenkins' story. Mary Bevan Green owned the big gray house that Georgia had recognized as soon as she had come into Newport. Oh. It was the house that she drew in crayons when she was a five-year-old. Now, the Green family, gets better, owned a fleet of paddle wheel boats that worked the Ohio River. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, a paddle wheel boat like the one that Tommy died on. Okay. So, a f oh, here's another one that gives me goosebumps. So a few feet from Mary Bevan Green's grave, just as in her dreams, she looks over and there's a statue of an angel. Of the angel with the... With its wow. right arm raised upward, just like she had seen in her mind. That is, that is really cool. So George's research in Marietta and Newport, Ohio, uh, they continued to bear fruit. Under hypnosis... She revealed the name of Tommy Hicks' parents as Tom and Jenny Hicks, and they found records of a farm owned by Tom and Jenny Hicks in Newport in 1906. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Still, who was Sandra? Well, next, Georgia turns to the nearest living relatives of Mary Bevan Green. There's still some alive. And when she goes to visit them, they take out a picture of the family that was taken in 1908. It was a, a picture of a family reunion. And she sees a girl in that picture, the face of a girl that she has drawn in crayon as a child 
and etched as an adult her entire life. It's the picture of, it's the face of Sandra. The problem is almost everyone in this photo is identified. There's like a roster of who's who, but the name of the girl is not there. Now, that's when a Green family member makes the statement, I don't know this girl's name, but I know she drowned out back of the house. The, the clinical psychologist who hypnotized Georgia, Dr. Smith, he says, you know, the facts of the case are really compelling, but his scientific mind needs more proof. So he kind of puts the brakes on it a little bit, and he says, look, almost every culture at one time or another has had a belief in reincarnation. Sometimes I think, in fact, that it's a metaphor for man's anger over the brevity of life. In terms of whether reincarnation is a real fact or not, as a scientist, I don't know. I want proof. I'm a doubter. But as a human being, I would love to have it be the truth. Georgia Rudolph, on the other hand, she no longer obviously has any doubt, and I sure wouldn't if I had experienced everything she had just experienced right. on her trip to Marietta. She said, I believe that reincarnation is real, but I'm not sure what reincarnation is. I know there's something to it. I have had an experience that a lot of people don't get to have. My logic oftentimes will tell me, now, this isn't real, but my heart tells me, yes, yes, it is. Well, Georgia Rudolph died in 2013. The quotes in the story that I'm telling you came from interviews done for an episode of Unsolved Mysteries that aired in the 1980s. Oh, I used to love yeah, watching it as a kid. You, I found it online. You can still find it and watch it for free online if you yeah. if you search for the, her story. The guy, the, uh, whoever the host was, I forget it, but he, he'd creep me out the way he talks sometimes. <laughs> I'd be more scared of him than the mysteries he was talking about. <laughs> he was very into it, yes, right. yes. Uh, but the story's not quite done yet. All right. Okay, so the show airs in the mid-1980s. In 1990, in Jackson Beach, Florida, a man is watching a rerun of that episode. His name is Jack Turnick, and he's 36 years old. He's a college professor. And as soon as he hears the details of George's story, he starts feeling this eerie familiarity to it. When he hears her use the name Tommy Hicks, he said it hit him like he'd been punched in the stomach. Turns out, Turnick had undergone hypnosis in 1988, and he had described a former life that jibed with Rudolph's story. So he wrote Georgia's psychologist, Doug Smith, and Smith agreed to hypnotize both of them at the same time. They met him on September 8, 1990 for this session. And at that time, Turnock started remembering a life as Tommy Hicks. He remembered dying a watery death. He said he fell from a riverboat into the Ohio River and that he was pulled under the paddles of the boat and killed. Huh. Now, under hypnosis, Turnock said he felt guilty for dying and leaving Sandra Jean Jenkins alone and pregnant. Did, did he know that she was pregnant at the time? Well, he... I'm not clear the way he stated that, whether men he, he felt guilty in this life, knowing that that had okay. happened, or if his spirit in the other realm was looking down and feeling guilty, like, oh, I, I've left her and she's alone and pregnant. Okay. I'm not clear. Um, but Dr. Smith, he said he hoped that the 20, it was a 20-minute reunion. He hoped it would give modern-day Georgia and Jack some closure. Um, and he said it was, it was a very emotional session, uh, the both of them, they were strangers, but they reached out, they held hands through tears, they they spoke of their love for each other. Um, Man, I wish I could see that on video. Yeah. There was a mention of it also being an update on an Unsolved Mysteries. I did not find that, but it might be, I'm sure it's probably out there if somebody wants to look for it. They might actually have the the video of that happening. Yeah, if you have it, uh, so. message, you know, give us an email at feedback at ohiomysteries dot com. But anyway, go ahead. So yeah, well, that's what I have for you, Steve. That's it for today, folks. Come back next week for one of our longer episodes with a full video treatment. 
And look, if you're into podcasts, be sure to look for Ohio Mysteries on your favorite podcast app. We produce brand new stories every Sunday and Wednesday night.